our next guest is David Pardo, and David has a long history in payments. Um, well, I think you worked at PayPal and you worked at eBay, and now you're at MasterCard. How did your journey bring you through to, to payments, and what's your passion? Um, so my passion, I think, would I would say is everything, everything new, everything exciting, everything that changes. Uh, my career wasn't shaped in the first place. I think I was lucky enough to actually follow, you know, on a 18-month kind of period and plan. Um, but I do get uh, to touch on companies that are not successful. Um, I joined those companies when they weren't necessarily uh, that big, at least in the space where I joined. Uh, so eBay was relatively new stage when I joined in the UK. Uh, PayPal, when I joined back in Asia Pacific, was 12 employees. Uh, so even though it was a global kind of brand, it was more of a startup kind of feel um, when I joined those, those teams. Um, I get excited so much so uh, about new things is that um, the MasterCard job I, sa I started on emerging payments, which um, is the part of MasterCard that really thinks a bit differently about payments, is we try to think about digital payments and how it's going to change and how it's going to shape in the future. Um, and we really think like startups. We really th try to basically think end to end about how um, those things will evolve and not getting uh, kind of attached to all the, the past history of MasterCard of actually doing very well in plastic. Um, I also coach a bunch of startups on the side, uh, so it's something that I, I felt uh, strongly being as part of the corporate world to still um, have a strategy piece on, on, on how to coach startups, not necessarily in the payment industry, but all the e-commerce, to try to shape a little bit what's happening in the space and, and you know, give my free time, I guess, for people to, uh, to try to shape more, more things and more exciting opportunities in the future. What, what, what kind of um, companies are you coaching? Are you, are you um, so I'm, I'm now part of a fund in the VC in Southeast Asia. Uh, most of the companies that I've started to coach approach me in the first instance because of my background. Uh, so it's like anything product, anything marketing, uh, e-commerce space, payments. Uh, and then it, it becomes an ongoing conversation with those guys of whatever they need at that stage because a real startup is um, the priority of the moment is a different one a week after. And what they need from their mentors usually is, well, this week they need uh, recruiting and they have a big gap in sales or whatever. And then the next week is, uh, we're re fundamentally rethinking about strategy and we need you as a kind of wall to bounce ideas against. Uh, and usually I don't give them answers, but hopefully some good questions to actually go the, the right direction and things like that. Um, so the type of companies actually evolve around e-commerce and payments usually. Um, Okay, that, that's, that brings me to my next question anyway, which is uh, we, we actually publish quite a lot of research and um, payment startups are by far the most common in both, I mean, Silicon Valley and certainly here and back in the UK, so in terms of funding, uh, in terms of number. So the really interesting question is there can't be enough room in the market for all of those companies. So what do you think make, would, will make, which, who will be the winners and what will make them sustainable? What, what's the key to that? Um, I like that question because everyone is asking us like who's going to be the winner okay. and how, how does that work and wh why would I be a winner against someone else. Um, I think the important piece to the puzzle is to really understand what is needed in the payment space. Um, and a lot of people think in silos of they need to actually have a piece of assets in every direction that they need, uh, that, that is needed, but the reality is they can partner with a lot of companies because it's very difficult to bring everything into one place. Um, so if I look at the type of assets that a payment company would need to offer, um, you're thinking about a consumer base. Okay, first thing is to actually have a bunch of consumers that are using your products. You're thinking about acceptance mark. Um, so how many merchants can you use your payments at? Um, and if you're not uh, surfing on the rail of someone else, um, how many merchants ac actually accept your product? Uh, the third one I would call uh, is, is kind of about the network in some ways. Uh, so like the infrastructure, the security, like how many transactions can you do per second and whatnot, which is re relatively hard to, uh, to do, and a lot of people have tried and failed in that, in that space. Um, I think the most important parts um, in the payment ecosystem of the last two, because it used to not necessarily play a role, and, and we're seeing new and new propositions that come in that space. The first one is data. It's like how much data do you actually have on your consumers, even though you have the consumer base or you don't, but you own the data of what is the behavior of your consumers and what's the pattern of how people use their, their, their payment instrument. And then the last one is user experience. And I think that's going to be a, crit a critical one in the payment space where a lot of people can truly innovate without taking care of like the four, four parts of the assets before and really start to think about 
how uh, a consumer experience should be, right? And that's the reality of, in most of the ecosystem that we've seen is the payment, uh, in the payment space is people concentrate on that user experience because I think there's a lot of room for improvements and that's the reality of it. Uh, so linking like data and, and you know, a user experience and things, you can actually create a, a user experience that is unique that we couldn't place in the industry 20 years ago. Right. Mobile phones playing a big role of it, um, anything that you can think of. What, what, what about the merchant experience as well? Does that matter? Yeah, on merchant side, same thing, right? So we've seen a lot of innovations on people trying to reach out to merchants that weren't served, for example, like the Square of the World, uh, yeah. uh, PayPal before that on, on online because those guys weren't served either. either. Um, there's going to be a lot of innovations. I think the innovation comes in place, and if you categorize all those companies into those five buckets of assets and where do they play, you'll see there's all kinds of players in the industry. The important and the interesting part is to actually figure out what they don't have, right? And who do they partner with when they go out and, and try to do the whole thing? Right, so partners are really, really important. I think so. In payments, nobody can really have a... Nobody can stand alone. Across, yeah. It's going to be very difficult to offer a full-on solution. Something, uh, we have a lot of members, we have a few really key companies in the group who are based around authentication, user authentication. Yep. And you've got so many people working on so many apps now, on, on mobile phones and everything. So, and there are lots of different ways to authenticate. So how, how important is that? And how is that going to work? Biometrics or what? How do you think this is? How are we going to identify people? If we're going to move everything to digital, that's fine. But how are you going to authenticate people? Yeah, I, I like that space because it's not a new space, but we come no. with a very different approach to how do we do. I, I'm going to kind of elevate the debate. I think it's not about authentication. It's about risk management. It's about how okay. to figure out who's doing the transactions in the first place and how much security you can have. So to me, there's a balance between the two. It's like how much risk appetite you have, and um, so like on security standpoint, and how much you want to hurt the user experience, because the reality, you're going to always use the consumers to give, us, give you more data so that you can feel more secure about who's doing the transaction. Um, I think in the space, everyone has playing a role, and I, I was actually in a meeting um, with Authentify, who's like playing big roles in biometrics and things, and we asked the same question. We're like, well, so how, how does that work? Do we really think that biometrics is going to go all the way and replace the authentication? And their point was, well, we're not different than any other mechanism. The reality is it's all about risk management. So I'll give you an example. Is when we came up with fingerprints, you can do it really, really narrow risk management and have a 100% or 99.9999% match on your fingerprints. And in that case, well, the reality is there's going to be a lot of people that can't log in in their, in their own phone. Or you take the approach of Apple when you launch it is you make it very wide, but unfortunately in 24 hours after, you're going to have a guy that is going to hack in your system, right? right. Um, and they published that and, and it became a big blah and whatnot at the time. So I think the important part is biometrics will play a role um, because I think from a user experience standpoint, it's probably more user friendly than a lot of mechanisms that we have today. The reality is how much. I don't think biometrics will be the only solution. There's always going to be other pieces to the authentication parameters. Um, but to me, is where that plays a role in the authentication is all about risk management and try to create a user experience that is simpler for consumers to go through what they do right now. Uh, so in the UK, they used to do text message and secure code and whatnot. Is that the right approach? Some of the countries think so. The US didn't think so. Um, where are we going next? Is that fingerprint? I don't, I don't know. But I think everyone has a, has a ballgame. Okay. okay. Uh, coming back to, to, to what you were saying about the user experience, and, and customizing user experience. Are we going to have to hand over a lot more personal information? I mean, I mean, you talk about big data, you capture all this information, and then you give us a better user experience. But we have to give, give you a great deal more personal information for you to create that user experience. So there's a whole trust issue there, isn't there? That's there so reason. how worried do we have to be as a consumer about handing all this information over? And, and who's going to control that information, although I get a better experience, you know, there's a, there's a whole issue there, isn't there, about trust? Yeah. How are you going to how are you going to resolve that? So, so the appetite of uh, of uh, information is is very something very personal. First, is like uh, you go across generation, across gender, across use cases. Everyone would have a different appetite as to what data they want to be collected on them and not. Right. I think the reality is there will be a common grounds as to where we stand, and that's usually where the regulation is going to come and say, this is what is, uh, what, it, what is allowed and this is what is not. Right. Uh, and the reality is at the moment it's a little bit gray because we're still trying to fundamentally uh, understand where the consumer stands. 
if you think about how um, the younger generations share their whole life on, on Facebook, for example, or something like that, and the older generation wouldn't or even post a picture of themselves because they're scared of hackers and whatnot, I, I think that appetite we need to understand. And the reality is, I think we can be a lot better than a, a full kind of um, approach to a one-off kind, of, uh, kind of stand where potentially what we need to actually do is, is, is ask the consumer for permission for every, for every um, piece of information that we collect and what to do with it. Um, I think the importance piece is, is, yes, it will be used in payments because that's the direction we're taking. Data has been quite central to what has happened as a revolution in payments in the past couple of years. I think what is going to be interesting is to see where people will ground and build new boundaries based on how the consumers get some, some advantage by it. Right? Is, um, if I ask you for 25 different questions, you may not want to see it, but if I say, oh, you know what, out of that you get a better consumer experience or a better security or whatever we're going to provide you, I think that's where it, it can play a role. So it's, a, it's not a, we can't collect data for nothing, that's the idea. Right, so we're still kind of learning where that line is going to be and where the regulation is going to be. Yes, we, there's a lot of regulations on it already, right? Um, um, and it's different by regions and, you know, the regulators are, are looking at big data in a big uh, way. Um, but I think the interesting part is, is, is to find the fine line for, for your own and your own usage and provide value back to the consumers. To, you know. Now I'm going to throw a really interesting Places. one at you, which is Bitcoin, which is a frictionless... We talked global about payment system. Yes. And you're a payment system. Now, does Bitcoin threaten MasterCard? How do you feel about Bitcoin? No. If I look on your face, what, what, how does Bitcoin fit in? And what do you think is going to happen to it? Is it something you need to be concerned with? Um, concern, no. Um, and I would tell you why. I think the bit that, I mean, MasterCard, in the first instance, we operate 150 currencies. Right. right? Uh, in 200 and plus countries. So the reality is, if Bitcoins becomes a real currency, there's nothing that stops us from actually doing Bitcoins currencies in the future. We're a network and we're actually a payment provider. We're a technology company. Nothing stops us from actually adapting a new protocol, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's if Bitcoins is the right thing. My personal opinion is, I think Bitcoin has a marketing problem more than anything else. Is I think they took the approach of taking a Bitcoin uh, as being a currency was I think the currency is the most regulated or one of the most regulated space ever. And to get into a new currency, everyone is going to care and care too much, right? And the regulators will have to say is if it's allowed and not. Um, I think there's a this very good par paradigm and usage of the Bitcoin technology that we didn't necessarily see yet, right? Where what they've invented is actually to provide a way for um, every piece of digital content to be unique. And I think this is actually very prevalent. Um, if you think about 15 years ago, Napster would have had that. Um, maybe the, the, the players in the music industry would have played with Napster, right? Or things that, I think there's applications of digital currency and what we find in Bitcoin that is very interesting. Um, if, is it Bitcoin or, or, or another currency in the future? I can't, I can't say. I think to me, as at the moment, based on the scale that it has and how much hip there is around it, to me that's disproportionate is in some ways we need to find a, a, a middle ground. And I think the reason why there's a hip around it is, is people care because it's currency, because it makes people dream, because there's a marketing positioning behind it. Um, but the reality is I'm, I'm not sure that's the right one uh, because it's gonna be very difficult to get the regulators to approve Bitcoins everywhere in the world or at least not care in the meantime. Um, so, so what you're saying is the, the blockchain protocol, this, what you're saying is Bitcoin is one use case of the blockchain protocol and that their choice of use case is unwise or, or you know. I'm not, not saying not it's unwise, wise, I'm saying it's hard. You're I'm saying, saying it's, it's hard. hard. They've chosen a particularly difficult use case to start with yep. to, to promote the specific protocol they have. I mean, I, I, I tend to, to, to agree that the protocol has a lot, many more applications and we're not seeing a lot of those yet. We're seeing a few people talk about them. And I think somebody mentioned t exchanging title deeds at, at our last session. Somebody mentioned to me applying for passports and other things. Is that, you know, the, 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 the protocol I think is highly valuable. Yep. Um, but yes, they have chosen probably a, a difficult regulated market, but I guess that's history. I don't know how that happened, but that's how it's happened. Yeah, and the, so. the, there might be some use case where Bitcoins as it is can address some of the, some of the problems. Are these people starting to ask the right questions to think about how we would manage like digital currencies because they've been around for a long time, because everyone is trying to crack that space. Um, 
but to be honest, I, I don't know what, what is going to come out of it. Uh, my assumption is that the regulators, by the time they're going to see that you know, most of that is actually being used for you know, money laundering and all that stuff, they're going to come around and say, well, you can exchange Bitcoins, but if you give all that information, and by the way, we need to do uh, know your customer KYC on your consumers and whatnot, and in that case, is that still valuable as a currency? I don't know. That, that's going to be the kind okay. of the long conversations with the regulators okay. by the time it comes on. Let me ask you our final question, which is, have we had, in terms of innovation, pay, digital innovation and payments, are we, are we coming to the end of the innovation or at the very beginning of it? Where, whereabouts are we? How much, more, how much longer has this got to go, do you think? How much more is coming? Uh, you mean in the payment space, right? In the payment Specific. space. Uh, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think on user experience, there's a lot of things that come. No, but I mean, to be honest, like anything innovation uh, centric is, okay, right now there's a revolution. The reason why we say that is there's, um, there's uh, elements of the ecosystem that are changing radically. And I think that it will uh, kind of create a new paradigm of how, to do, how we do payments in the future. Uh, the reality is, I think the, the innovation won't stop because we're in a world where innovation triggers more innovation and, uh, and user experience improvements, you can always find better ways to do things. Um, so, and you know what, merchants, there's always gonna be merchants that are not accepting payments today. And you know what, well, Paperworks was talking about it before, but cash is 85% of uh, payment volume in the world still, right? So there's still an enormous amount of space for us to grow into. Uh, and. I think working in the digital, comp in the digital uh, environment is, is very exciting because the big part of the pie we don't address yet um, it, worldwide. Is, is that true? 85% of the 85 globally of cash. is yes. still cash? Yeah. Okay, so there's plenty of headroom. Yes. yes. Okay. But thank you. Shall we? <laughs> I didn't know that. Shall we um, take some questions? Does anyone have a question? I wonder if um, you can comment on the Ping It API by Barclays. On the what? The Ping It API. Ping It. Where where people can uh, make um, money transfer from one mobile phone to another. Not exactly mobile phone, but um, they, um, um, they use uh, mobile phone number as an address, and they, you can link that mobile phone to a bank account. So you could basically send um, anyone you know, within the UK, right? And then some um, South, um, some uh, African countries as well. I'm so they have the plan to expand it. So uh, my personal view is that it's going to be great for um, cross-border um, micro lending, but um, I'd love to hear your opinion about. If not ping it, then the general idea of trans um, um, money pay money transferring um, cross-border and the application for the mm -hmm. micro lending. Um, I think to your point earlier, that's one of the applications where there's a ton of space to grow. Um, we talked about the unbanked and. The numbers that you've seen in the previous presentation are pretty, uh, are pretty steep. The reality is if you look worldwide, it's actually a lot worse than that, right? Like the unbanked population is, is massive in, in regions like Africa and like India and like even in China where, where they have a, a high GDP and it's now the second uh, biggest country in the world, uh, PNB, biggest uh, in the world. I, I, I don't know if this one is gonna be the one. The reality is what they do in Africa is, is definitely the right way. They invent their own network. Um, I think it's something that we, we need to look more into. The reality is all those players will need to play together at some point because the reality is if I can pay you but I can't pay you know, what, someone else in the room, it doesn't make sense. We're talking about acceptance. For P2P, it becomes crucial that actually there's interconnectivity between the systems. Um, so I always worry about that player that is gonna address the whole of the ecosystem. To me, is they need to get plugged into something else. Um, so play with others because it will add functionality to the consumers, it will add usage, it creates them more brands because there's gonna be more usage and things like that. So I think that's the piece that I worry about for those, for those guys. Um, okay, can we, can we give you the mic? Yeah. Ramesh Lex, Green Catapult. I advise large banks and payments firms. I'm curious about your thoughts on the whole e-wallet market. Uh, there was a time when you guys, uh, payment providers, you, Visa, and, uh, have still have the leadership on that space, and we have the telcos and the mobile players kind of stepping in. You have Google Wallet taking off, and that's been riding up stream mm -hmm. uh, based on the expansion of Android in the market. But uh, adoption on the Google Wallet has been patchy. Uh, and then the retail banks are kind of laggards they're kind of ramping up still on their e-wallet initiatives. Yep. What is your perspective 
I would have, you know, liked to know on how that landscape is evolving, and uh, where where do you think, you know, both from a maybe from a Mastercard perspective as well as your personal perspective on how this landscape is going to go in the next year or two. Okay, um, there's many questions in your question. Uh, so. The first question, the first answer would be, of course, we're going to win in this space because we're the best, right? No. So, so jokes aside, I think the, uh, the payment space on e-wallet is slightly different, but relatively based on the same kind of five pieces of assets. Uh, and if you were to judge anyone, any player in the industry, what you need to look at is those five assets. And that's what I, what I, what I um, would, would, uh, would challenge for those players, right? Um, the reality is there's always one part of the element that is missing at the moment. Um, in the e-wallet market, uh, PayPal has been great online. The reality is they don't have acceptance mark on, on, uh, on offline. They don't even have a user experience yet that everyone can identify as being a, a, a good uh, improvement. Uh, other players in the industry try their best to do things. Um, the reality in the space is we need to look at it holistically on saying how many merchants will actually accept, uh, where is the consumer base, and who is going to play. If it's a telco, they have a lot of consumers. But if their wallet is not usable anywhere, nobody is going to use the wallet, right? Um, what's the user experience like? Um, Google's approach is data. Um, they're going to, I think, if I was Google, right, just for payments at the moment, I would actually think about how much data they can actually leverage to create a user experience that is different or a personification of the payment that would be different. Um, they haven't done that yet. Uh, I think most of their um, user experience is, is pretty basic so far. Um, or we've seen other players doing something similar. Um, so I think the reality is it's either one player that is going to play in the five type of assets that we talked about, um, or someone that is going to partner very well with other players in the industry and is going to be able to do it. My assumption is it has to come through partnerships because it's too difficult to do everything. And a lot of new players uh, kind of um, uh, don't think about it that way because they think they have the consumer base and that's sufficient. The reality is they don't have the merchant acceptance or they don't have the data or they don't have whatever. I think the idea is can they partner with someone else to try to think about how we do those things? Uh, and it's something that Mastercard strategy from an EY standpoint, we tend to believe more than the others. Is we facilitate, we've been investing more into the API stuff than more, more, than, more than creating a user experience that people can identify to because we know we're not going to create every piece through the puzzle, so what we want is to have the tools to be able to partner with the right people. Yeah. David, thank you very much. Thank you. I enjoyed that. That was interesting. Oh, very good. Very interesting. Thank you.